Hello there, Sergeant Major here in South East Queensland and welcome back to the channel. This video is a very long term review of my Yamaha FZ6S or Phaser as it's affectionately known. I bought it some 15 years ago. To hear more about this underrated Sport 600, stay tuned. How I parted company with my previous bike, a 2006 Yamaha R1 and ended up with the Phaser in 2008 is an interesting tale that goes something like this. I was heading home from work one night, closely followed by a Subaru WRX. The driver was erratically lane changing in an attempt to make up a second here and a second there. You know the type. At the next set of traffic lights, I gave the R1 a good handful in first and second gears to put a hundred metres or so between me and the car. The next moment there was a bright flash, the type you might expect to see from a forward facing speed camera. I looked down gingerly at the speedo and for a moment thought I saw something like 124 km per hour. I must have been mistaken however as we were in a 60 limit. Anyway, because motorcycles don't generally have a regio plate on the front, I heard no more about it. Whatever the speed, I concluded that the R1 was out to kill me or at least to get me banned from driving. Hastily, I traded the two-year-old R1 for a brand new Phaser 600. Initially, the dealer lent me a Phaser 1000 to try and make the sale, and presumably while they looked over my R1 trading. But with its tall gearing, it was all too similar to the R1 for me, albeit a little bit more comfortable. I went for the 600 version, as it was more practical, lower geared, and still plenty fast enough for the road. First gear is very short, which is not only great for getting away quickly, but it's also helpful for pulling away under better control with a pillion, passenger and luggage on board. The FZ6 is powered by a fuel injected 599cc 16 valve engine derived from Yamaha's R6 though it's down some 30 horsepower on the R6's peak power. The Phaser's engine sports different cams and other internal components and is tuned for better mid-range power and torque for road riding compared with the more track focused R6. As a consequence of the detuning however, the Phaser's unit has excellent reliability. Peak power is now 98 horsepower or 72 kilowatts at a screaming 12,000 revs per minute and peak torque of 63 newton meters at 10,000 revs. So maximum grunt is still at the top of the rev range. The FZ6 pulls well enough from 5,000 revs in most gears and more so from 7,500. With its non-adjustable suspension, except for the preload, the FZ6 is only a sports bike and not a super sports by any means. The Phaser's 51% front and 49% rear weight distribution promotes good and predictable handling in most conditions for the road, but when it's pushed in the twisties you can tell that you're not on an R6. There are no electronic rider aids whatsoever, not even ABS. With an irrelevant top speed of 141 miles per hour or 226 kilometers per hour, it's quite fast enough for the road. To pull the bike up there are twin disc brakes at the front and a single at the rear in the usual fashion for this category of bike and these are more than adequate. I'm 5 foot 10 so the Phaser's seat height of 795 millimeters means I can just about flat foot it. The ergonomics triangle of the seat, foot pegs and handlebars fits me like a glove but once aboard the bike does feel quite wide and I've tweaked a hip joint more than once getting on and off it. All the controls are within easy reach and are found where expected.
The adaptable FZ6 is equally at home as a commuter, street fighter, sports tourer and sports bike for carving up the twisties. Good weather protection is provided by the bikini fairing and the screen, though a small duck of the head is still required to get me completely out of the wind at higher speeds. I've heard it said that the bike looks a little odd or awkward from the side, possibly so, but I think it looks neat and tidy enough from the front and the rear. In the showroom it looks better in black trim, so I opted for this. I particularly like the look of both my FZ6 and R1's underseat exhausts, which were fleetingly popular at the time, if a little impractical for the long term, and therefore didn't stand the test of time. The bike doesn't run too hot, as the R1 did with its cooling fans constantly heating the already sweaty rider still further each time you came to a stop. The phaser is much better in this regard, the cooling fans only operating in prolonged stationary traffic on the hottest of Australian days. The phaser has a decent sized fuel tank of some 19 litres, which provides ample range, though I've never done a full range test to empty on this bike. 250 kilometres is never a worry between fuel stops, and like any other bike, the economy depends entirely on how you ride it. The official economy quoted by Yamaha is 22 kilometres per litre, or round about 5 litres per 100 kilometres. Online range estimates vary between 380 kilometres and 420, which seems a little optimistic to me, going on the rate the fuel gauge falls. I usually set out fully fuelled and only rarely have to top up in order to get home again. Really the only modifications to the bike are on the left here I fitted a USB socket for phone charging etc and on the right a helotype connector to enable battery maintenance between rides. Both are fused at 10 amps. Prior to purchase I had the dealer fit oggy knobs in case I ever dropped the bike, but fortunately I never did. Other than these small mods the bike is completely standard. Maintenance is reasonably easy and not required too frequently. The oil filter and drain plug are both easy to access, so there's no excuse for not servicing the bike on time. Embarrassingly though, I've never looked at the spark plugs, as a couple of them are tricky to access. It's only on its second set of tyres, and other than that, maintenance has been confined to fluid changes and chain cleaning and adjustment. The FZ6 came with the centre and a side stand, the former making chain maintenance fairly easy. The battery has been replaced twice in the 15 years to date, it's located under the fuel tank which is not that easy to access. The tank will tilt forward after removing the seat and the rear tank retaining bolt, so complete removal of the tank is not required to charge or change the battery. But this is why I added a remote charging socket, as batteries are not cheap. Other than regular servicing and maintenance, the bikes never needed actual repairs as such. Many YouTube reviews of the Phaser recommend this bike for new riders. I'm not sure if they mean when new riders obtain their full or open license because most countries have some power to weight restriction for learner or inexperienced riders. I believe this bike did come in a power restricted form. Maybe these reviewers are recommending the reduced power version? I however would not recommend my version, a 100 horsepower machine for new riders, even on a full license, until they've cut their teeth on say a 250 to 400 cc machine first, for the following reason. I got my full bike license in the UK in 2004 via a short 5 day course. This was aimed specifically on passing the test and nothing more. The first two days tuition were spent on a 125 machine, followed by two more on a 500 twin. I think it was a Kawasaki ER5. On day 5 you had your test, and if successful, 
as I was, you could immediately and legally ride any bike regardless of your experience, or in my case, lack thereof. My previous riding included a few months on a Yamaha FS1e, a 50cc moped, and later 18 months on a TZR125. However, 14 years had now passed with no riding experience between selling my TZR and going for my full license. Now, with my new full license in hand, I set out to buy a brand new super sports bike. I settled for the slightly more conservative Honda CBR 600F1, pictured here. I had been determined to buy the very track focused CBR 600RR, but after much persuasion from the responsible salesman, a certain Mr Clive Paget of Batley in West Yorkshire, I was talked out of it. Nevertheless, the CBR 600F was far from underpowered. With over 100 horsepower on tap, I had many unnecessary near misses due to my lack of self-control and experience. 100 horsepower is just too tempting and 30 to 40 horsepower is almost as much fun and can be much safer whilst learning your craft. That said, we all have to find our own way in life. The now 15 year old Yamaha FZ6 has proved to be every bit as reliable as my older TTR 250, which incidentally I also kept for 15 years after buying new in 2006. I recently replaced the TTR 250 with my beloved 2019 Suzuki DL 250V Strom. So is it a problem running older bikes? Well, my experience is that it's not an issue if the bikes get old while you own them. But buying an older bike is a different question altogether, where much of the history may be unknown. Everything is costly to repair these days, so if you're thinking of buying an older bike, do your research first, and if you can, take along somebody who knows about bikes. Look for an example with good service history and be prepared to walk away if advised to. Don't be in a hurry to buy the first one you look at. I buy new, or as nearly new as I can afford. For example, when I decided that the replacement for my TTR 250 would be a new V-Strom 250, I learned sadly that it was no longer available here in Australia as a new bike. But after much searching, I found a two year old example with one previous owner and only 2,240 kilometers on the clock. It also had most of my intended modifications already fitted. So if buying used, look for a low mileage pre-owned machine as likely the first owner will have been careful with the bike after splashing out the big bucks initially. Whereas a dealer's demonstrator will often have been thrashed by many test riders one after another. So buy your used bike carefully and just as importantly maintain it carefully too. This need not be expensive as maintenance usually takes more time than money. Buy bikes from a reputable manufacturer and choose a model with a reputation for reliability. Having purchased your pride and joy, exercise some mechanical sympathy. Let the bike warm up at idle before riding and avoid using full throttle until she's fully warm. Watch the oil and filter change intervals and service at or before the kilometres due or at least annually if you're not doing the distances. Check fluid levels, chain, tyres, lights etc before each ride. These preventative measures can save you a lot more than just money. It all helps to tip the balance in your favour. The FZ6 depreciated about $8,000 in the 15 years I've owned it. That's around $500 a year. As I consider selling it, it's worth about 40% of its new cost. I'm told that the learner legal power restricted phases hold their value here in Australia much better compared with my full powered version. In contrast though, my TTR 250 depreciated only $3,000 over the same number of years. That's a mere $200 per year on average. The TTR was sold privately in 
2021 for 50% of its new cost. So clearly make and model of motorcycle can make a big difference to the cost of ownership over time. The Sports 600 has served me very well and it's done everything I've asked of it. Yamaha's FZ6 wasn't really a popular bike and it didn't sell in the numbers that Yamaha had hoped. Consequently you don't see them around much which is a real shame given their versatility and bulletproof reliability. The fit and finish had stood up well though she's been garaged for most of that time and has covered only 15,000 kilometres under the harsh Australian sunshine. There are some scuffs on the plastics which is to be expected for a bike this age but as I consider selling her she's scrubbed up well possibly for the last time. We'll see perhaps in the next video. Until then, ride safe, motorcycling brothers and sisters everywhere. And as always, thanks for watching. Until the next one, see you now.